Introduction to Quantum Information Processing. Welcome to Lecture 3, which is about superdense coding and measurements involving multiple qubits. Interesting properties of the so-called Bell basis will come up here, and in addition to measurements with respect to the Bell basis, we will see some other kinds of measurements, including measurements of subsets of qubits. Finally, we will see some exotic measurements that can distinguish between non-orthogonal states in a novel way. Suppose that Alice wants to convey two classical bits to Bob by sending only one classical bit. Alice receives her two bits, A and B. She somehow creates a one-bit message to send to Bob, who is supposed to determine both A and B from this bit. This is impossible to do perfectly. The highest success probability possible is one half, and this can be obtained by Alice just sending the first bit and Bob randomly guessing the second bit. This strategy has success probability one half in the average case as well as in the worst case. What if Alice can send a qubit? It turns out that this still does not help. The best success probability is still one half, which is a consequence of a result of NIAC. Now, let's add a twist. What if we allow Bob to send a bit to Alice before Alice sends her message to him? Alice receives her bits. Bob sends a bit to Alice, then Alice sends a bit to Bob, and then somehow from this Bob is supposed to determine A and B. That extra bit of communication from Bob does not help. Intuitively, this is because the flow of information is in the wrong direction. How does Bob sending a bit to Alice provide him with any more information. To be sure that there isn't some subtle way in which Bob's message helps, we would need to think about this carefully. But let's just accept without proof that the best possible success probability still comes out to one half. In fact, if Bob sends a bit the wrong way and then Alice sends a qubit to Bob, even that does not help. The best possible success probability is still one half. So, it seems that messages sent in the wrong direction are of no use. In super dense coding, Bob first sends a qubit to Alice, and then Alice sends a qubit to Bob, and that actually makes a difference. Alice receives her bits. Bob sends a qubit to Alice. Alice sends a qubit to Bob. And then Bob can perfectly determine both bits A and B. Sending a bit in the wrong direction does not help. But somehow, sending a qubit in the wrong direction does help. How does super dense coding work? Let me show you the protocol. First, Bob creates this entangled two qubit state, an equally weighted superposition of ket00 and ket11, and then he sends the first qubit to Alice, and he keeps the second qubit. So Alice and Bob each possess one qubit of this two qubit state. Next, Alice does the following. She has her two input bits. A and B. First, if A equals 1, she applies the poly X gate to her qubit. Otherwise, she does nothing. Next, if B equals 1, she applies the poly Z gate to her qubit. Otherwise, she does nothing. Then Alice sends her qubit back to Bob. 
Now, let's look at how Alice's operations affect this, the state. This table shows all the possibilities. If A and B are both zero, Alice does not modify the state at all. If A is one and B is zero, look at the third row. The effect of the X gate is to flip the first bit, which changes the superposition states to ket zero one and ket one zero. If A is zero and B is one, look at the second row. The effect of the Z gate is to put a minus sign in the superposition. And in the case where both A and B are one, both the X gate and the Z gate are applied, yielding the state in the fourth row of the table. There's something interesting about these four states. They are orthogonal to each other. They are an orthonormal basis for the four-dimensional space associated with two qubits. This is called the Bell basis, named after John Bell. Note that there is a normalization factor of 1 over root 2 that's not written, so as to reduce clutter. Sometimes you will see this for quantum states. The convention is that the actual state is the vector in normalized form, that is, the vector multiplied by the inverse of its length. Now, returning to Alice and Bob's strategy. Once Bob receives that qubit back from Alice, he possesses both qubits again, and they're in one of the four bell states. What Bob does now is he measures those two qubits in the bell basis. By that I mean Bob converts the bell basis to the computational basis and then performs the basic measurement on them. This circuit with a controlled NOT gate and a Hadamard gate performs the conversion. This table shows what computational basis states each bell state gets converted to by the circuit. It's straightforward to verify this. Notice that when Bob measures, the two-bit outcome is exactly A and B, the two bits that Alice is supposed to send to Bob. So that's how super-dense coding works. It makes use of an interesting property of the Bell basis where, in step two, Alice applies an operation to just one of the two qubits. She only has one qubit in her possession, but by doing so, she can change the state to any of the four Bell basis states. That step wouldn't work if the computational basis were used. Alice could then manipulate the state of the first qubit, but she couldn't do anything to the second qubit, which is in Bob's possession. And there's no way of doing this using classical bits. Now, we've previously seen the technique of measuring in an alternate basis. For example, in lecture one, in order to, to distinguish between the ket plus state and the ket minus state, we measured with respect to that basis by applying a suitable unitary operation to convert that basis to the computational basis. In this case, Bob measures two qubits with respect to the Bell basis by also performing a suitable unitary operation to convert that basis to the computational basis. What we are going to do next is further explore notions of measurement. First, I'd like to show you a more general notion of measurement than anything we've discussed so far, which is called an incomplete measurement. We need at least three-dimensional quantum state vectors to show this kind of measurement. We'll soon be talking about two qubit systems whose state vectors are four dimensional. But let me start with three dimensional systems where the space is easier to visualize. For a quantum trit or qtrit, there are three computational basis states called 
ket0, ket1, and ket2. The type of measurement that we have so far does the following. It projects the state to one of the computational basis states, where the probability of projecting to each such basis state is the projection length squared. The outcome of the measurement consists of two parts. Classical information, indicating which basis state occurred, for Qtrits that's 0, 1, or 2, which we can imagine is what we see on the screen. And there is also a residual, or collapsed, quantum state, which would be ket0, ket1, or ket2. An equivalent way of viewing this is that there are three orthogonal one-dimensional subspaces. The span of ket0, the span of ket1, and the span of ket2. And the state has a projection onto each subspace. And the square of the length of that projection determines the probability of that outcome. An incomplete measurement is like this, except that the orthogonal subspaces need not be one-dimensional. For example, for Qtrits, consider these two subspaces. The horizontal plane spanned by ket0 and ket1, which is two-dimensional. And the vertical line spanned by ket2, which is one-dimensional. These two subspaces are orthogonal to each other, and together they span the entire space. The incomplete measurement with respect to these subspaces is defined as follows. Any amplitude vector, a unit vector, has a projection on each subspace. The squares of the length of these projections add up to 1. The outcome of the measurement is classical information indicating which space was collapsed to, and the residual collapsed state, which is either a state in the horizontal plane or a state in the vertical line. If the state has amplitudes alpha 0, alpha 1, and alpha 2, then the outcome is the plane with probability the absolute value of alpha 0 squared plus alpha 1 squared. And the outcome is the line with probability the absolute value of alpha 2 squared. Notice that the residual states shown are the projections onto the two subspaces, which are not unit vectors. The actual residual states are these vectors normalized, following our convention of dividing each state by its length, so as to be a unit vector. In the case of the first outcome, the residual state can still be an interesting quantum state in the sense that it is a superposition of basis states. So that's how we extend our notion of a measurement to include incomplete measurements with respect to orthogonal subspaces. The definition of an incomplete measurement is needed to make sense of scenarios like the following, where we measure a subset of the qubits. For example, if there were two qubits, and we want to measure just the first qubit, notice that the two-qubit system might be an entangled state. So we cannot just ignore the second qubit and use our previous definition for measuring a one-qubit system. There might not be an amplitude vector for the state of the first qubit. This half-circle shape on the circuit diagram is our way of denoting a measurement of that qubit in the computational basis. Notice that the wire coming out of the measurement gate is a double line. We can think of the double line as a thicker wire that carries classical bits. So the outcome of the measurement is either 0 or 1. The actual qubit will be in state ket0 when the classical outcome is 0, and ket1 when the classical outcome is 1. This measurement is defined as an incomplete measurement in the following way. 
consider these two two-dimensional subspaces. One is the space of all linear combinations of ket00 and ket01, which is all states where the first qubit is in state ket0. The other is the space of all linear combinations of ket10 and ket11, which is all states where the first qubit is in state ket1. These two spaces are orthogonal to each other. Every vector in one space is orthogonal to every vector in the other space. So we have two orthogonal two-dimensional spaces within the four-dimensional space of two qubit states. We take the incomplete measurement with respect to these spaces. Any quantum state has a projection onto each subspace. The projection onto the first subspace has length squared alpha 0, 0 squared plus alpha 0, 1 squared. The projection onto the second subspace has length squared alpha 1, 0 squared plus alpha 1, 1 squared. These are the probabilities of the two outcomes. Now, let's look carefully at the respective residual states. Of course, they are understood to be normalized, divided by their length. The first residual state can be written as a tensor product of ket0 and a superposition for the second qubit. Similarly, the second residual state is a tensor product of ket1 and a superposition. So notice that for the residual state, the first qubit after the measurement is in state ket0 or ket1. And we can just output the corresponding bit for the output of the measurement gate. And the second qubit, which is not measured, in general remains in a superposition. That's how we define the measurement of the first qubit of a two-qubit system. As an exercise, you could work out what the corresponding definition for measuring the second qubit should be. And there's a natural generalization of this for measuring any subset of the qubits of an n-qubit system, but let's not go there now. Instead, Let's get used to the case of measuring the first qubit of a two-qubit system with the following exercises. Our first exercise is kind of a sanity check. If we have two qubits, we could imagine measuring the two qubits using our earlier definition of measurements in multi-qubit systems. This measures the whole four-dimensional system in one fell swoop and the outcome is either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. Or, we could imagine measuring the qubits one at a time, using our incomplete measurement to measure the first qubit, yielding a first outcome bit, and then measuring the residual state of the second qubit to get the second outcome bit. The outcome probabilities for the four cases, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, should be exactly the same either way. I'll leave it to you to convince yourself that this is the case. For the second exercise, work out what happens if this entangled state is measured. What are the outcome probabilities for the first qubit and the corresponding residual states of the second qubit. It's not too hard to work this out, and you might pause the video now for a little while to think about this. Okay, so the answer is, with probability one half, the bit outcome for the first qubit is zero, and the residual state for the second qubit is state ket zero. And with probability one-half, the bit outcome for the first qubit is 1, and the residual state for the second qubit is state ket1. So what essentially happens is that both qubits collapse together to ket0, or they both collapse together 
to cat 1. Considering this, a natural question is, does measuring the first qubit change the state of the second qubit? What do you think? Later on, in the information theory part of the course, we'll learn a language that enables us to express this sort of thing more clearly. For now, let's address this question by thinking about it another way. If it were the case that measuring the first qubit changed the state of the second qubit, then it would be possible to use this effect to communicate very fast, or even instantaneously, over long distances. Let's consider this question. If Alice has the first qubit of this state in her lab, and Bob has the second qubit in his lab, which could be very far away, can Alice communicate information to Bob by performing a measurement on her system? Is the answer to this question yes or no? I'm going to leave this question for you to think about. Let me just make the comment that, to answer this question, you need to think carefully about what communicating information actually means. A third question concerns the Bell basis states. Suppose that we play one of those guess the state games again, where someone sends you one of the four Bell states, without telling you which one, and asks you to determine which one it is. But suppose that they only send you the first qubit of the Bell state. Is there some measurement procedure that you can perform on that single qubit that determines which Bell state it's part of? Or can you at least acquire some partial information about which Bell state it's part of? You could, of course, ignore the qubit given to you and just randomly make a guess among the four possibilities, with probability one quarter for each case. Let's use that trivial strategy as the baseline. That's what you can achieve without even looking at the qubit. Is there any measurement that you can perform on the one qubit that enables you to do better than that baseline? Can you determine which Bell state with any probability greater than one quarter? You might pause the video to think about this now. Okay, it's fairly easy to check that measuring your qubit in the computational basis will be useless. You'll just see a random bit with 50-50 probability, exactly the same distribution for each Bell state. So there's no distinction in the four cases. And with a little more work, you can check that measuring with respect to any other basis, for example the plus-minus basis, doesn't help either. So the answer is no. You cannot get any information about which Bell state from just one of the two qubits. And I'm going to leave it to you to confirm this. Now, Let's consider two different ways that one can encode two classical bits as qubits. The first way is the most straightforward way as computational basis states, as shown in the table. The two-bit string AB is encoded as ket AB. Clearly, you can recover the classical bits from measuring the two qubits. The second way is as a Bell basis state, such as in the last column of the table. Now, if the two qubits are considered as one system, it doesn't make much of a difference which encoding you use, because you can always convert between the two encodings by a unitary operation. However, if the two qubits are localized, say Alice possesses the first qubit and Bob possesses the second qubit, then there's an interesting difference. For the case of the computational basis, Alice can determine the value of the first bit, but not the second bit. Also, Alice can flip the value of the first bit, 
between 0 and 1, but not the second bit. She has complete control over the first bit, A, but no access to the second bit, B. On the other hand, for the case of the Bell basis encoding, Alice has no idea about either bit. She cannot see the value of A nor of B. However, Alice can flip either of the bits. She can flip the first bit by applying a poly X, and she can flip the second bit by applying a poly Z, and she can flip both bits by applying both of these polys. Informally, by using the Bell basis, each party individually foregoes the ability to read any of the bits being encoded, but gains the advantage of being able to flip both bits by a local operation on just one of the qubits. This weirdness of the Bell basis is the driving force behind superdense coding. Since we've been looking at some interesting measurements, now is a good time to see the exotic measurements that I referred to in passing in the first lecture, but never actually explained. First, to review, we have our basic measurement operation, which is with respect to the computational basis, ket0 and ket1. Then we have a notion of measuring with respect to any orthonormal basis, for example, with respect to the plus-minus basis, which can be simulated by preceding a basic measurement with some unitary operation. The more exotic measurements that I want to show you are of the following form. Let's assume here that we are performing this measurement on one qubit, called the data. Upon receiving that qubit, we can create a second qubit ourselves in state ket0. Combining the data to be measured with that second qubit, we have a two-qubit system with four-dimensional amplitude vectors. By the way, when a qubit is added to a system like this, that qubit is frequently referred to as an ancilla. Think of it as an ancillary qubit. Next, we apply some four-dimensional unitary operation to the two-qubit state. Finally, we perform a basic measurement to the two qubits, resulting in one of four outcomes. If you're seeing this kind of measurement process for the first time, then you might wonder what the point of doing all this is. Is there anything special that these exotic measurements can achieve? In fact, they are very useful. What I'll do next is show you one example of an application of these measurements to something called zero-error state distinguishing. The scenario is once again that we're given a state that's promised to be one of two specific states, psi0 or psi1, but we don't know which one, and our goal is to determine which one by some measurement procedure. Remember that we can do this perfectly if psi0 and psi1 are orthogonal, and we cannot do it perfectly if they are not orthogonal, such as the case where the states are ket0 and ket+, plus, where the angle between those states is 45 degrees. A zero-error procedure for state distinguishing is one that never gives the wrong answer. But that does not mean it always gives the right answer, because the procedure is allowed sometimes to abstain from giving an answer. Formally, in our context, there are three possible outputs of the procedure. The output can be zero, meaning I guess that the state is psi zero. The output can be one, meaning I guess that the state is psi1, and the outcome can be A, meaning abstain, in other words, no guess. To be zero error means that whenever the output is zero or one, it is always right. 
Now, there's a very trivial procedure that's zero error. The procedure can simply abstain all the time. But that, that's not so interesting because it never guesses the state correctly either. A non-trivial zero error procedure is one that sometimes does not abstain. And in such cases, the guess has to be right. If we have a zero error procedure, its success probability on an input is defined as the probability that it gives the right answer for that input. Think of a situation where you can make a guess about something. When you are right, you are rewarded. When you are wrong, you are penalized. But you also have the option of abstaining, in which case you get no reward or no penalty. Maybe the penalty for a wrong guess is extremely high, so you cannot afford to ever make a wrong guess. But you'd still like to sometimes get the reward, so you don't want to just abstain all the time. Okay, so what's the best zero error success probability for distinguishing between the cat zero state and the cat plus state? Please feel free to pause the video now if you'd like to take a crack at figuring this out by yourself. We will design an exotic measurement process for a pair of non-orthogonal states with arbitrary angle between 0 and 90 degrees. The idea is based on a nice geometric arrangement of vectors in three dimensions. To see the arrangement, you can cut out this gray rectangle and fold it 90 degrees in the middle. The result will look something like this. I found it fun to actually cut it out and fold it and I have it here on my desk. The template is on the course website. But maybe you can just visualize things from this diagram. Note that the states ket0, ket1, and ket a are three mutually orthogonal states. So it makes sense to perform a three outcome measurement with respect to these states. Now look at the way Psi0 and Psi1 are arranged. Psi1 is orthogonal to Ket0. So for a measurement of that state, the outcome will never be 0. It will always be either A or 1. Similarly, Psi0 is orthogonal to Ket1. So for a measurement of that state, the outcome will never be 1. Based on this, we have a zero error measurement procedure for distinguishing between the states Psi0 and Psi1. The probabilities of the various outcomes are given here. They depend on the angle theta. The angle between Psi0 and Psi1 is related to the angle theta. Note that this angle is not 2 theta because of the fold. There's a nice relationship between the inner product between Psi0 and Psi1 and Theta. Can you see what this relationship is? You can pause the video if you'd like to think about this now. But I will leave it as an exercise here and continue. Once we have this, it is straightforward to work out the success probability as a function of the inner product between Psi0 and Psi1, which I'll also leave with you. Therefore, if we have two three-dimensional states, Psi0 and Psi1, arranged in this manner, then there is a nice zero-error distinguishing procedure. Looking at the diagram, you can see that if Psi0 and Psi1 are almost orthogonal, then the success probability will be near 1. And if they are very close together, but not the same, the success probability will be positive, but close to 0. Now, let's get back to the specific problem of distinguishing between Ket0 and Ket+, plus, whose angle is 45 degrees and whose inner product is 1 over root 2. We'll solve this problem in the framework that we just worked out, 
using two qubits, but using only three of the four dimensions. First, we add an ancilla in state ket0 to our input state. If our input state is ket0, then the resulting two qubit state is ket00. If our input state is ket plus, then the resulting state is ket plus tensor ket0, which we can abbreviate as the ket of the symbol plus zero. Note that the inner product between these two states, ket00 and ket plus zero, is one over root two. Second, we apply a unitary operation that maps these two states to the psi zero and psi one in our previously analyzed scenario. In order to do that, we associate our ket one zero with ket a, as marked. We associate our ket zero one with ket zero, and we associate our ket zero zero with ket one. For a suitable choice of theta, the psi zero and psi one have inner product one over root two. We apply a unitary operation u that maps ket zero zero to psi zero and ket plus zero to psi one. Since the inner products are the same, such a unitary u exists. Third, we measure in the computational basis so as to get the zero error distinguishing procedure. I'll leave it to you to work out the success probability. To attain this success probability, we need an exotic measurement. If we restricted our operations to one qubit unitaries and one qubit measurements, then the success probability would be lower. Okay, let's end the lecture on this.